your Bibles to Psalm 27. If you don't know where that is, pretty much if you take a Bible and open it right in the middle, you'll probably find the book of Psalms and then look at, uh, to find Psalm 27. A month ago in the Wall Street Journal, there was a guest column written by a, a psychoanalyst uh, named Erica Commissar, and she was describing the, the rise in anxiety and depression among children and adolescents. And then she went on to write that, that much of this can be explained by the decline of religion. Decline of religion, rise in anxiety and depression among children and adolescents. She said this, quote, uh, nihilism, uh, which is a view of just the life is empty, meaningless, void, there's no hope. Uh, nihilism is fertilizer for anxiety and depression and being realistic is overrated. The belief in God in a protective and guiding figure to rely on when times are tough is one of the best kinds of support for kids in an increasingly pessimistic world. True enough. But then she gives this advice to parents who don't believe in God. Lie to your children. She said, you can't just tell kids that they will simply die and turn to dust. That would be harmful for their ability to cope. She says that since religion gives children community, a sense of meaning, values of empathy and compassion, and will protect them from anxiety and depression, even if there is no God, no heaven, we should just tell kids that there is. This morning, we're going to read a passage of scripture that brims with confident faith and lasting hope. But is it just wishful thinking? Is it just a lie to tell to your kids? It makes all the difference in the world whether or not the God it describes is really real. So listen, follow along as I read Psalm 27. As you see here, written by David, the great king of Israel. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is a stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet I will be confident. One thing have I asked of the Lord. That will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me, and I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord." Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. You have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger, O you who have been my help. Cast me not off. Forsake me not, O God of my salvation. For my father and my mother have forsaken me. But the Lord will take me in. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Give me not up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and they breathe out violence. I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong, and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. This is God's word. Here's a sermon in one sentence. You can see it on the back of the worship folder with an outline for this morning. Those who know the God who saves will seek him in every circumstance. Those who know the God who saves will seek him in every circumstance. And as we work our way slowly through this psalm, my prayer is that you will know and seek 
this God who saves. Not just a, a lie to tell the kids. The God who is. The I am. The psalm breaks down into four parts. And the first part being verses 1 to 3. I've called this part confident faith. If the Lord is your salvation, see him as your security in a hostile world. Let's just read 1 to 3 again just so it's fresh in our ears. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is a stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet I will be confident. Yeah. We're, we're, we're drawn to confidence, to, to people who are confident. We want to be confident. We want to be the bold and the beautiful, not the timid and the tentative. David, the one who wrote this psalm, these, these lyrics, was a man of action. You know that if you have read the Bible, First and Second Samuel. He's most famous, of course, for being the kid that dropped the giant, Goliath. He, David grew up to be a famous warrior and a memorable king. He's the, the kind of guy that we would expect to be confident, that just kind of has a, maybe just a little bit of swagger, you know? He's, he's just, he's not kind of standing on the sidelines. He is, he, when he enters the room, people turn around and notice. One of the most confident individuals of the last generation or so was Muhammad Ali, the legendary boxer. He died a few years ago. Uh, he would have been this month uh, 78 years old. And one of my favorite stories about him was when he was taking a flight and the attendant comes by and asks him to to buckle his seatbelt. And he, he says to her, Superman don't need no seatbelt. And she shot right back, Superman don't need no plane. <laughs> this psalm was not written by someone who thought he was Superman. David knew he was not. This is a confidence born out of a relationship with God. This is someone who's relying on God to save his life. He says he's under the attack of, of evildoers, adversaries, foes. And, and again, if you, if you know the story of David that we have in the Bible, you, you know this, this could reflect any number of experiences that, that David had. He was, he, he was in life-threatening circumstances many times. He's on the run, uh, in hiding or in combat, uh, but he says, the Lord is my light. In the blackness of confusion, hopelessness, despair, he's the beacon that guides you to safety. He's the light at the end of the tunnel, the light that is like, yes, a glimmer of hope. The Lord is my salvation. When life hangs by a thread, when death stares you in the face, he is my rescuer. He's my deliverer. The Lord is a stronghold of my life. When I would be left vulnerable, exposed before the enemy, bearing down on me, he's my fortress, my refuge, my strong tower. If the Lord is your salvation, it means you're safe. And the bad guys are doomed. When they try to chase you down, verse 2, and you are panting to stay on your feet, knowing if you slip, trip, just a moment, you're done for. You're, you're running, panting, struggling, and they are the ones who fall, David says, because the Lord is your salvation. If that's true, then what do we have to be afraid of? They can come at me with an army, he says, and they can declare all-out war. I'm still confident. But get this. Understand, read this carefully. This is not a self-confidence, but an unshakable God confidence. What is it that you need? What is it that your kids need? More, more self-confidence? Uh, self-confidence is not wrong, understood in its place. But folks, what we need is not a self-confidence, but an unshakable 
God confidence. That's great for David. I'm glad this is his testimony. What about you? This is not written as a historical narrative to, just so we can learn about how David felt, what David believed, David's attitude. It's a song that he wrote that was sung and was intended to be sung by all of God's people, inviting us to share the confident faith that David had. You may not have David's skills with the sword, his knowledge of the wilderness that allowed him to be elusive. You may not have David's guts, but you can have David's God. That's how you can have his confidence. Because it's a confidence in the Lord it's a confidence that we believers can have today, even though we're not in that same uh, Old Testament setting. The, the writers of the New Testament call believers like you and me to see salvation that God has accomplished for us in Christ that we have already remembered earlier in the service and based on what Christ has accomplished for us, the victory that he has won, Paul will say to the Romans, if God is for us, finish it with me, who can be against us? Or John will write to the churches in 1 John, he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Of whom shall we be afraid? In a world fraught with danger, with, with death nipping at your heels, you can try to be confident by, by telling yourself, I am enough. That's the strategy for some, but it won't work because it's not true. You are not enough. God is enough. The Lord is sufficient. And you can sing this song, taking David's testimony on your lips, which invites us to, to join, to share in his Confident faith, to profess that same faith. If the Lord is my salvation, my salvation, then you need to see him as your security in a hostile world. As the psalm continues, we see this is not a passive faith. It is a passionate pursuit, part two. If the Lord is your salvation, seek him as your greatest desire. Verses 4 to 6 is the next part of the psalm. Let me read that for us again. One thing have I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. Now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me, and I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Worship certainly is the theme of this section. You can see it in the sacrifices offered, the songs sung in verse 6 that I just read, and in all three of those verses, the focus on the house of the Lord, or also referred to in these verses as the temple or the tent, meaning referring the, to the tabernacle. David uses those terms, temple, tabernacle, interchangeably here in this psalm, even though we often think of the, the temple building uh, as, as opposed to the tabernacle, the tent, the movable worship space built by Moses and contrasted with the, the stone edifice paneled with cedar, ornamented with gold, built by David's son, Solomon. But again, David's referring to both of these as a, the dwelling of God. He's using these terms interchangeably. Uh, worship is the theme that sets apart this section, though it is still very much connected to what came in the first part. Because verse 4, David longs to be in God's sanctuary because 5, because God will make it David's sanctuary, his place of safety, so that, six, having been saved, he will give God the praise he is due. Now, if, if that's all that worship is, then we have a problem. What problem? What's, what's the problem? Because if that's all that it is, then, then worship would be something like this. I can use a, a comparison from maybe a, a recent situation for you. Let's, uh, 
I'm sure many of you decorated your home for the holidays, prepared a big meal with plenty of other snacks and treats, and you wrapped a lot of presents, and you waited for your family to arrive. What if the kids, grandkids, came in saying, I'm starved. What's to eat around here? And then after devouring what's on the table, well, hey, uh, what about the presents? And uh, it better be what I, I put on my list. Then after the floor is strewn with uh, paper and ribbons and a uh, fairly sincere but quick, uh, thank you, they walk out the door with their loot. How would you feel if that happened at your house? You'd feel taken advantage of, taken for granted. You would not feel loved or honored. How do you think it is for God when that happens at his house? Hey, could you help me out, God? Hey, thanks, bye. The Lord will happily provide what you need, but he needs to be what you want more than the stuff he gives. And that's what David shows us here. It is. Look look again. First, though he wants the Lord to be his shelter, God, I need you to be my safety, my salvation. The thing he asks for, the thing he actively pursues is to dwell in the house of the Lord in order to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord. This is about David's presence in God's presence. he's He's not coming over to God's house and spending all his time looking at his phone. He's... He's coming to God's house to look upon the face of God, to behold the glory. It's about spending time. It's about deepening relationship. It's about valuing God himself. God, you are the one I care about, not just saving my skin. Another way we see this is not a a mercenary kind of worship is... uh, that he wants to dwell with God all the days of his life, note that phrase, so that God will shelter him, next verse, in the day of trouble. See that? I want to, be, I want to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Sounds like the end of Psalm 23, right? I want, I want to dwell with you all the days of my life. That's what I seek. That's the one thing. So that God will, you will shelter me on the day of trouble. David is not living life on his terms, every day is my day, and then when the day of trouble comes, well, better, I better get to church. I haven't prayed in a while, but here goes. Maybe he'll you know, help me out. Rather, I want to walk with God every day so that when the hard days come, I know he'll be with me. And then, when God takes care of you in the day of trouble and you come to worship, singing your heart out, Singing with a passion that you simply did not have, you could not have in the easy days, then you can be sure that your joy is not just your personal relief. Whew, I'm so glad that the problems are taken care of. You know that your joy is in the Lord. You are singing your songs of joy, your shouts of joy to the Lord. If the Lord is your salvation, seek him as your greatest desire. It's a question that we are confronted with in the psalm. It's it's one that's good for us to be confronted with, even if it's a little uncomfortable. It probably is. To ask ourselves, is, is, is the Lord my passionate pursuit? It's not enough to be able to say, well, okay, okay, Bruce, you're a pastor, and of course you're into the Bible, and theology, stuff like that. I, you know, I'm just a, an ordinary person. I'm, not, I, I don't, I'm just not into that kind of stuff. Well, he, understand, you don't have to be a scholar to gaze upon the glory. You don't have to be an expert. You don't have to be a linguist to behold and to desire to behold God for all that he is, believing that if we just saw more of him, if we just knew him to, in all the goodness that he has, we would want him more. We would long to love him more. He probably won't be spending every day at church. For most of us, it's about 
uh, having this be the one thing is about putting God front and center in all the other aspects of life that we have. Uh, marriage and family or work, career, sports, hobbies, interests. That was the message, if you may recall, if you were with us for a family camp uh, back in August, uh, our speaker, Joe Rigney. But he also said, it's not just, okay, God at the front and center in all of the things that we can rightly enjoy as God's gifts in our life, but, but there's also another important biblical perspective that's reflected in this psalm that when all those other things begin to crowd us and press in on us and start to crowd out God, sometimes you just have to say, stop. There's one thing. There's one thing. This is what I need. This is what I want. With all the, yeah, the, the, I've got a job and I've got a family, I've got kids' activities and there's sports and I've got I to gotta fix up the house and all this stuff to do, but on and on, but we need the words of this testimony, of this song, one thing have I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon his beauty. But as the psalm continues, sometimes it's the day of trouble that, that really spurs us to seek him in the way that we should. This is part three, fervent prayer. If the Lord is your salvation, cry out to him in your time of need. This is verses seven through 12. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. You have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger, O you who have been my help. Cast me not off, forsake me not, O God of my salvation. For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Give me not up to, to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and they breathe out violence." Did you notice this? This is the only part of the psalm, this, this section is the only part that's addressed directly to God as prayer. Only this part. Now, that's not surprising. What is surprising is how anxious, how desperate David seems to be. And after he started out so confident, some scholars have even wondered whether this, these are actually two different psalms, just clumsily put together because uh, you've got this confident faith in verses 1 to 3 and then ending with joyful worship in, in 4 to 6. Well, there you go. Put it in the hymnal. Play it on the radio. This, this will be popular. So our idea maybe of what makes a good song and a happy ending has us scratching our heads and, and even worse maybe is what it seems to say about God. Is, is it possible that, that God would cast him aside? That he would cast someone? Me? Aside, is it possible that God would leave him in the hands of his enemies? Would God do that? There are a couple of clues in verses 8 and 9 that will help us understand this. And for the record, I, I do believe this is, this is absolutely one psalm. It is meant to go together. And we just need to, to see how it fits. There are a couple of clues, though, in verses 8 and 9 that, that are going to help us understand how this fits. He says, you have said, speaking to God, you have said, seek my face. Well, I'm seeking you. Uh, and then later, oh, you who have been my help. That means we're hearing David wrestling with God as he faces fresh opposition, new challenges, which becomes also a new challenge to his faith. Particularly, when it seems that God does not answer right away. Instead of reading this as teaching that God, mm, he might abandon you, or hearing it, I want you to hear it as describing the way believers sometimes feel. When God has not yet answered your prayers, and there's a big difference between those two, those two readings. Have your prayers ever sounded like this? I mean, I paraphrase here. God, why won't you answer me? 
In the Bible, you say I should cry out to you. Well, here I am. I, I'm, God, I'm not, I'm not looking to experts or to friends or uh, the internet. I, I'm seeking you right now. And, and I'm not looking for a refuge in anything or anyone else, not in, not in food or not in, in the new stuff I got, the, the shopping that I want to do for all the deals that are going on. I'm not looking to, to anything else for refuge, not alcohol, not marijuana, not sex. I'm, I'm, it's you I'm seeking You are my light. You're my salvation. You're my stronghold. Don't leave me hanging. But notice, this is not the prayer of a, I think you can hear this, right? It's not the prayer of a hopeless, faithless person. Verse 9 says, you have been my help. I'm crying to you, God of my salvation. My own flesh and blood may forsake you, but not, might forsake me. They might turn me away, but not you, God. Verse 11, show me, not not just the way out, show me your way, oh Lord. That's that's where I want to be. If the Lord is your salvation, cry out to him in your time of need. Of course, this psalm makes us a a little uncomfortable, maybe a lot uncomfortable. We, We all want the confidence that's, a, that's the first part of the psalm. We all want the passion and the focus of the second part, the, the triumph, the victory, the joyful shouts of praise. Nobody wants the anxious, desperate cries of part three, but sooner or later, they will come. And this psalm is here to teach us to live in the ups and the downs. And there will be more than one up and down. This psalm is here to teach us to prepare us for those moments. Yeah. Nobody wants to be in that situation. But does it comfort you to know that David was there sometimes? Does it comfort you to know that there are people all around you in this room right now that have been there sometimes? Does it help you to pray when you know this? He won't forsake you, though it may feel like he's forgotten you. I take And David turns from talking to God to talk once again to us. Like the beginning of the psalm, it's a a testimony of faith. But it's also David calling us to trust God too. This is persevering hope. If the Lord is your salvation, trust him to deliver you in his time. Verses 13 and 14. I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Now, this is so much more positive, of course, than the, than the last section, but don't miss this fact. He says that while he's still waiting, that's, that's when he's talking here, he's still waiting on God to deliver him, and he can say this. He can have this kind of bold, confident statement. Now, the, the land of the living here, it's an expression that happens many times in the Bible, and at least in my family, it's used occasionally. Uh, after someone maybe has been in bed with the flu for a couple of days, and then they finally emerge from the bedroom, sort of dazed, bad hair, bad breath, and like, oh, well, look who's joined us in the land of the living, right? Uh, for David, this really is the difference between life and death. This is, picture David still in the cave in the wilderness, hiding from Saul who wants him dead. This is David while fleeing Jerusalem, running from his son Absalom who would, wanted to take him out so he could take his throne. This is David staring death in the face, peering over the edge of the grave, looking to going on his way to Sheol, the place of the dead, not knowing if he'll ever see his home or family again not knowing if he'll ever bring an offering or sing songs to the Lord again in his presence in the place of worship. But he believes that he will. 
And he calls you to that same persevering hope. Everyone who picks up this song, who opens up this song book and takes these words on her lips, he's calling, we are calling one another as we read this psalm. We are teaching one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to wait for the Lord, be strong, take courage, wait for the Lord. It may not seem very relevant to you in the moment. Maybe not. Maybe, especially when you read this and you're like, enemies, adversaries, people who want me dead. I don't know. I'm not sure that this really speaks to my situation. I hope at some point already you've seen how this psalm speaks to you, but maybe it doesn't have a great deal of urgency. Uh, Every time I come to this psalm, I... I remember an article. I'm not really a good one for remembering stories or, or articles that I've read or things like that, but this, this is something I read 16 years ago, and it, it stuck with me, and I think of it every time I read Psalm 27. I think I may have shared it in one other sermon, perhaps. It's the story of Elizabeth, the daughter of Christian parents who grew up in a small village in Southeast Asia, when Elizabeth was 16, a relative in her village said she could find a well-paying job in a neighboring country. So eager to help her family and to earn money for college, Elizabeth went with the woman who handed her off to traffickers who shipped her across the border. There, Elizabeth was forcibly confined to a brothel where for about $250, a man purchased the right to take away her virginity. She was held in the brothel for seven months where she was raped by customer after customer. Elizabeth could easily still be in the brothel, as hundreds of thousands of girls are worldwide, if investigators from International Justice Mission, a Christian ministry, hadn't rescued her and persuaded local police to raid the brothel. When they arrived, they found that Elizabeth had written on the wall in her own language, Psalm 27, 1, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? There were dozens more scripture verses on the wall of Elizabeth's room, or more accurately, her cell, all written by hand, taken from the Bible she read when not being forced to serve customers. But Psalm 27, describing the psalmist's trust in God, even though evildoers assail me to devour my flesh, was what Elizabeth's rescuers saw and remembered. Too many of us, if we, were, if we were in a situation like hers, trapped, abused, feeling utterly abandoned, few of us would come up with, we, we would look at Psalm 27 and we would come up with all kinds of ways that that just doesn't work for us. Psalm 27 is too confident. But listen to this psalm again. Not as a bold testimony, Listen to it as the words that you might need to speak to your own soul. Picture David in the cave trying to remind himself. Picture Elizabeth in her room, her cell, taking these words as her only hope. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who will stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet I will be confident. One thing have I asked of the Lord. That will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. And I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. You have said, seek my face. Your My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. Hide not your face from me. 
Turn not, turn not your servant away in anger. O oh, you who have been my help, cast me not off. Forsake me not, O oh God of my salvation. For my father and my mother have forsaken me. But the Lord will take me in. Teach me your ways, O oh Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Give me not up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and they breathe out violence. I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. How can it be possible to wait for the Lord, to be strong, to let your heart take courage? You have to believe that God, the Lord is your Salvation, that he will come through. He will save you in the end. But understand, it is not the, it's not simply the belief telling yourself that it's true. The only way for there to be real hope in this, the, the kind of hope that can sustain you in the dark, is that God is real. That he is trustworthy. That he is the God who saves. And if you're a Christian here today, saying this, yeah, that's what I Uh, That's what I believe. You have all the more reason to believe even than David could have seen in his lifetime because Christ did stare death in the face and he went to the grave to pay for your sins and mine so that God would never turn you away in anger. Never. Jesus went to the grave He came back to the land of the living so that even those who die with faith in Christ, whose life and testimony is, all I want is to see your glory, then you can have the assurance. In spite of suffering and trial and persecution, that beyond the day of trouble, there will be unending days when we will see his face. So seek him today. Believe, be strong, take courage, and wait for the Lord. He is your light and your salvation. Let's pray. Oh, we need you. We need your word, your promise. We need you. So we're thanking you that you've given us this, this word that helps us. We, we, we say we believe in you, but we don't know always what that looks like and sometimes how challenging it can be along with days of joy and confidence. So wherever we are, God, whatever day we find ourselves in, I pray that the one thing that is clear for us every day is that we're seeking you. We want to know you. We want to love you more. We want to be with you, with your people. And God, I pray that you would prepare us if we're not even if we're not already there that you would prepare us for the day of trouble with your promise with your presence and as we take hold of psalm 27 we're taking hold of you in Jesus name